Good morning. And what Good morning and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center's On the Record virtual briefing. I'm Liz Detmeister, Director of the Foreign Press Centers, and this morning I'm pleased to welcome our briefer, Julie Stuft, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Visa Services in the Bureau of Consular Affairs at the Department of State. Today, she will provide an update on immigrant visa processing at U.S. embassies and consulates. Before we get started, here's a quick review of the ground rules. This briefing is on the record. We will post the transcript and video of this briefing on our website, fpc.state.gov. If you publish a story as a result of this briefing, we kindly ask you to share a link to your story by sending an email to us at dcfpc at state.gov. Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Stuft will give opening remarks, and then we will open it up for questions. I will start with the questions that were pre-submitted, and then if you have a question, please go to the participant field and virtually raise your hand or type your question into the chat. At that time, we will, when you're called on, we will unmute you and request you turn on your video so you can ask your question. If you wish to be on camera for the entire briefing, please turn on your camera now. And last and most important, if you've not already done so, please rename your Zoom profile with your full name and the name of your outlet so I can know who's asking a question. And with that, I'll turn it over to Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Stuff. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you to the Foreign Press Center for the invitation to be here today. Good morning, everyone. Um, to all the journalists on the line, thank you for dialing in. It's really a pleasure to come here today to speak to you about the State Department's efforts to process immigrant visa cases during this challenging period. I also want to share how we're working on reducing the current backlog of these cases. You may have seen that I did a similar briefing last week with a more domestic focused audience, so I'm glad to be here to address any specific concerns your audiences may have. We're working under three guiding principles as we address the backlog of immigrant visa cases. First, we want to acknowledge the stress and hardships borne by petitioners and applicants due to reduced capacity to adjudicate visas during the pandemic, various restrictions on visa issuance and COVID related limitations on everyone's travel. We know this is difficult and we're striving to provide the best possible service while doing so safely. Which leads me to my next point. The health and safety of our personnel and our clients coming into our consular sections abroad continue to be our highest priority and the department's highest priority during the pandemic. Finally, I'm sure you're aware of President Biden's initial actions on immigration, in particular executive order 14012 on restoring faith in our legal immigration systems. I want to reiterate our commitment at the Department of State to resolve backlogs and process visas as quickly and efficiently as we can while remaining committed to the national security of the United States. So let's turn to the current situation. I'm sure you saw the announcement of the rescission of Presidential Proclamation 10014, which means there is no general restriction existing on issuing immigrant visas. However, many immigrant visa applicants are subject to other presidential proclamations, including those for uh, certain countries during the preceding 14 days before entry or attempted entry to the United States. These countries are China, Iran, Brazil, UK, Ireland, South Africa, and the 26 countries in the Schengen area. Spouses and children of US citizens and legal permanent residents are accepted from these restrictions. Fundamentally, very importantly, we are still in the midst of a global pandemic that has had a dramatic impact on our visa processing operations. The pandemic has limited our operations in two main ways. It drastically decreased the number of people we can safely move through our facilities overseas, and it reduced the number of staff that we can safely have in the office interviewing visa applicants at one time. If you're here as a member of Foreign Press, uh, chances are you've spent some time in a visa waiting room at one of our embassies or consulates overseas. Many of them were built to hold hundreds of people at a time so that we could serve thousands of people in any given day. In this era of social distancing, we've had to drastically reduce those numbers for everyone's safety, even in our largest spaces. And of course, we must adhere to local host government restrictions on activities due to the pandemic. All of these factors mean that by definition, we can't serve nearly as many people as we did before the pandemic. Given these challenges, we are taking three key steps to address the situation. 
First, we prioritize the processing of immigrant visas at every post. As there is capacity, they will, these will be the first visas adjudicated. Among those, we will continue to prioritize the processing of immigrant visas for the spouses and children of US citizens, including fiance visas not subject to regional restrictions. As I said at the start, we recognize the stress and hardship on these families. Second, we are constantly seeking creative ways to increase the number of immigrant visa appointments we can safely offer. We generally must conduct immigrant visa interviews in person, and we are also required to collect biometrics from our applicants. Given that our physical spaces overseas are so different, many of these creative solutions are context specific. One embassy has outfitted alternate spaces within the embassy complex to create physically distanced workspaces to process more applications. Other embassies and consulates are cross-training personnel so that more staff can process immigrant visa applications. As we collect and share these best practices, we will find new ways to serve as many applicants as we can safely. Finally, we're committed to transparently sharing the current status of our worldwide visa operations with you. In my briefing last week, I shared some statistics that you may have seen. In January 2020, there were about 75,000 immigrant visa cases pending at the National Visa Center, ready for interviews. 13 months later, in February 2021, there were 473,000. Please note that this number is not inclusive. It does not include cases already at embassies and consulates that have not yet been interviewed or applicants who are still gathering the needed documents before they can interview or petitions awaiting U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services or USCIS approval. Our priority in the visa office is reducing this backlog, all the while ensuring the safety of our staff and applicants and protecting our national security. We will be transparent about our progress. One caveat, I can't promise you that the numbers will decline month to month. So many factors influence the number of appointments we can safely allot, especially the progression of the pandemic in different countries. We expect this effort to take time. There are three things immigrant visa applicants should keep in mind while they're going through this process. First, the fastest and easiest way for you to get the information you need is to regularly check the website of your closest US embassy or consulate. That is where the most up-to-date information about operations will always be, as well as information about the best way to get in touch with the embassy or consulate. Second, please ensure the email address that we have on file for you is accurate. That's where we will always send instructions. If you do, not, if you do have a question and need to contact your nearest US embassy or consulate, please do so only once. Include your case number so that we can find your case more efficiently. While we are always open to answer your questions, multiple phone calls or emails about the same issue will slow down the process for everyone. Finally, please come to your appointments prepared with the documents outlined on your appointment letter. Just like with communications, using multiple appointments to present more information will slow down your visa processing as well as others. Again, we're looking to serve as many people as we safely can, and we're grateful for your patience. With that, Liz, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Julie, for those helpful remarks. I'm gonna start by um, relaying a question that's a little off topic from the reason for your uh, briefing today, but which was one of the most common topics brought up in our incoming questions before the briefing. And that is whether you can provide any update on two things related to I visas, which are the type of visas that foreign correspondents use to uh, work as journalists in the United States. First relates to whether you have any news on when I-Visa appointments might be more available at embassies overseas. And the second question that was very frequent is whether you have any updates available on the proposed change to duration of status for holders of I-Visas once they arrive in the United States that was pending last fall. Thank you. Great, thanks very much for that. Um, we do understand that this is a, an issue that's on everyone's mind, certainly those of you who are on this call um, and we do uh, want to address that. Immigrant, so excuse me, um, I visa or journalist visa um, category visas are being adjudicated in our post overseas as they have capacity to do so. Again, I would refer uh, everyone to the embassy or consulate website to check to see if they are, um, if they are adjudicating. But yes, as capacity allows, our consular sections will be adjudicating uh, journalist visas. With regard to the uh, 
the uh, duration of status part of this, which I know is also um, on everyone's mind, uh, as you said, we refer you to DHS for that. We don't have any updates uh, on the status of that policy. Okay, thanks for that. Um, let me turn to one of the other pre-submitted questions. Um, we had a question about Presidential Proclamation 10014 entitled Suspension of Entry of Immigrants Who Present a Risk to the United States Labor Market During the Economic Recovery Following the 2019 Novel Corona out Outbreak was rescinded on February 24, 2021. Individuals whose DV 2020 visas have expired may not be issued replacement visas according to the Department of State. However, individuals who received diversity visas in 2020 as a result of orders in the court case Gomez versus Trump may travel to the United States on an expired visa. But some airlines are denied bo denying boarding. How does the Department of State coordinate with airlines? Mm -hmm. Thank you. We do coordinate closely with airlines uh, with regard to, to visa categories that are able to travel. And as you noted for the DB 2020, um, there were um, uh, there was a policy uh, initiated by the secretary to allow those 2020 visa holders to travel to the United States. We are not aware at state of any problems with boarding planes by those individuals, uh, but DHS, uh, we refer you to DHS for more information on um, the interface with the airlines. Thanks. And now let's go to a live question. We have a question from Dmitry Kirsinov from TASS. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Hi. Hi, Madam Secretary. Thank you so much for doing this Zoom. And thanks a lot to our colleagues at the FTC for arranging this. My question is very narrow, I hope, and country specific. And it's about non immigrant visas. Again, I type. Uh, the, the current I type visas issued to Russian journalists have a, a validity period of 12 months. And the maximum validity period is currently, as far as I understand, five years, 60 months. So is there any chance the U.S. might extend the duration of I-type visas for Russian reporters? That's my question. And, and a small point, if I may, we did ask about those proposed uh, DS changes. Uh, we queried the DHS. We never got any response from them. So if you could just you know push them a bit or follow up with them, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think that we'll take that uh, so we can get you a robust answer. All right, thanks, Julie. We'll get back to you, Dimitri. Um, next, I see a question from Philippe Rader from AFP. Philippe, can you unmute yourself and go ahead? Yes, hello. Thank you for, for, for this briefing. Uh, I am correspondent at UN, so I have a visa I. My wife living with me is not a journalist. She is not allowed to, to work in US. She has also the same visa. Since last, last summer, when we have to go to France, we are obliged to get an NIE at the US consulate in Paris to be able to come back at New York. For me, it's not too difficult because I'm working. But for my wife, especially if she travels alone, there is a big risk for our point of view for her to not get an NIE NIE and be stuck in France without a possibility to come back at home in New York. Do you plan to facilitate, to facilitate uh, my and her return next time we are going to France? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. I would ask too that we be able to take that question to respond to your specific points. Okay. Thanks. Okay, next I see Katerina Soku. Katerina, would you please um, go ahead and let us know what outlet you work for, please? Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for doing this briefing. I work for Greek Daily, Kathy Marini and Sky TV. Uh, my question is, on, uh, if I understand right, on the current H-1B restrictions that were imposed by the Trump administration, these are set to expire on March 31st. And I understand that the Biden administration does not plan to renew them. Is that correct? And if I may just add here, uh, 
the current H-1B restrictions apply also to someone who had actually had the H-1B for years and, and just need them visa for their passport to come back to the States. Is that something that you're going to address as well? Thank you very much for that question. Um, I will refer you to the White House to uh, to for any questions on Proclamation 10052, which I think you're referring to there. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, I see a question in the chat, which I will read. It is from Kishore Panthi from ABC TV. There are just seven months to issue diversity visas for the 2021 winners. Judge Amit P. Mehta of the United States District Court for the District of Columbia ordered the U.S. Department of State to preserve 9,095 visas for 2020 diversity visa lottery winners that have been unable to complete their applications due to an executive order issued by President Trump. How do you manage the resources to issue those visas? Do you have enough resources for that? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that. I first want to emphasize that uh, I don't, I won't comment on uh, pending litigation, but uh, I can address the issue of DB 2021 cases, which are currently being scheduled at all of our embassies and consulates overseas that have the capacity to process those. Uh, so, so our posts are going forward as they can with adjudicating 20, DB 2021. Um, obviously, always, you know, we're emphasizing the importance of health and, and safety, both for our personnel and for our applicants coming in. Uh, so that's always going to be paramount in how those local conditions are considered for capacity. Um, but, but we are doing DB 2021. Thank you. Next question is from Mushfiqal Mazal, Fazal, sorry, from Just News. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Yeah, thank you for this briefing. Yeah, may I know, I'm just asking question on particular on Bangladesh, uh, because uh, recently we heard that the B1, B2, especially the visitor visa is not issuing. I can guess the, for this pandemic, but be, be, before before the pandemic, uh, uh, people are who are applying. I got some information that is uh, B one B two decline ratio is higher. So, is there any particular reason for this? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't know exactly what our um, posture is right now at Embassy Dhaka but I would refer you back to the website. Our posts are committed to making sure that our web, their websites are up to date. And that is the most up to date information about the current posture of, of who's being interviewed currently. Um, so with regard to non-immigrant visas, or of course, immigrant visas, uh, which are our priority, um, that's going to be laid out on the website, sir. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to read another one of the pre-submitted questions. And that was, what specific steps will embassies have to take to inform beneficiaries of IVs or immigrant visas that will allow for the beneficiaries to be pandemic travel ready? For example, vaccines, uh, PCRs, or travel with the visa, within the visa's time frame or deadline. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Uh, we don't have any updates at this time on um, on new steps for immigrant visa processing. So the current uh, the current steps as laid out uh, online and, and given to applicants by email are, are still stand. Okay. Um, and online, I here in the chat, I've been contacted by Razi Kanik Kliegel. Sorry if I've didn't pronounce that correctly. Uh, Razi, if you have a question, please go ahead and let us know your the name of your outlet. Yeah, hi, uh, hi, my name is Razi Kaniklikil and I'm from Hurriyet, Turkish Daily. And I don't know if you have my, uh, uh, my camera is not working, I guess. That's anyway, okay, my, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, very good. So uh, the uh, question is about uh, family separation. Uh, something came to my attention one of our readers and she has a b1 b2 visa and tried to enter the us at the miami airport but she denied the entry uh, but her 
daughter is 16 years old and she's a US citizen and she's attending high school in Miami and she was alone and she didn't have anyone with her because this person without her B1, B2 visa older, she's doing like some kind of business between the Turkey and the US textile business. She travels a lot. And because she was, because her daughter was born in the US, she wanted her to get US education. But now she's, she denied the entry and her visa is canceled and she doesn't have any access to her daughter. And during the pandemic, and she sent back on the same flight. And, and because the consulates are all closed in Turkey, she doesn't know what to do. She tried to reach them, nobody get back to her. So she sent me a letter about this family separation issue. I really don't know about that detail. I know it's about the Mexican border. I think I'm not sure if it's related to Europeans or other in other countries. So this is obviously a minor uh, girl and she left alone during the pandemic and her mom, uh, she's a single mom and she she's desperate now and, and she doesn't know what to do. And she approached it to me and I thought this is a good platform to ask uh, what, what to do about this. Is there like a law that uh, unites uh, the mother and daughter? Is it only for the Mexican border? Thank you very much, Razi, for that question. Um, we uh, There are a couple reasons that obviously I can't respond directly to this case. I'm not familiar with the details um, and we have uh, visa confidentiality restrictions, but um, I would advise uh, your reader to contact uh, either DHS or state, um, including the local embassy or consulate that issued the visa that she traveled on uh, to find out what, what happened in her case. Uh, we should we have staff who can certainly clarify uh, the issue for that's, her. That's the thing. They they couldn't reach anyone, and that's why they sent me a letter, a long letter. I might forward to you. I mean, I I didn't know what to tell them. So, but if, if you if you wouldn't mind sending that to the Foreign Press Center, um, we can certainly send it to our public inquiries unit. Okay. Thank you so much. And is there any news timetable for visa departments to open in Ankara or Istanbul? Any timetable? No, that's a great question. Um, you know, we obviously would like to go back to full operations as soon as possible, but we um, are completely, you know, restricted based on health and safety of, of our employees locally and of our applicants coming in the section, as I said. So uh, every post worldwide is uh, analyzing based on their own local data, when they can safely reopen and how many people they can have come into the embassy. So it really does differ by each post. Um, but I can tell you that as soon as it's safe, um, our, our teams will be resuming operation, phasing in operations um, as according to the prioritization that's online. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julian. I know you only had about a half hour available for us today. So I would just put out a last call for any questions about immigrant visas, which is uh, assistant, acting deputy assistant secretary Stuff's area of, of expertise. And, um, and I really wanna thank you. As you can tell, uh, visas are very important topics for all of our attendees today and, um, and the human element of uh, the, the State Department's work uh, facilitating travel is is so important. So it's wonderful that you could be here with us. Um, any, I see we still have two questions. I'll just um, go ahead and call on Mushfiqal Fazal from Just News, um, and um, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. This will be the last question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking me the que my question again. So can I ask any uh, question about a visa restriction? I'm not sure it is. And it, 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 uh, the S Deputy Assistant Secretary will be able to answer this because the we we saw in Myanmar uh, that uh, for the many of the Army General or uh, the U.S. restricted visa. So uh, we see, uh, so if if I can ask about Bangladesh because many people, particularly law enforcement agency, they are involved in extrajudicial killing 
and and you know the so uh, i think the you are following the closely following the situation what's going on in bangladesh so can we ex expect anything on bangladesh those who are involved in extrajudicial killing to restrict the visa so i'm not sure if this is the right platform to answer this question so, thank, thank you, you very much i appreciate the question we'll, we'll take that for you and get back to you thank you we'll make sure to follow up with all the people whose questions were taken and um, with this i'd like to conclude the briefing i, I thank acting deputy assistant secretary stuffed again for your participation i thank you all for your very interesting questions and i will follow up by sending out the transcript when it's available and the video of this post of this uh briefing will be posted thank you all so much goodbye thank Have you very day. much